Hello, this is David Nelson, and this is the next edition of our Celebrate Aging Roadshow. And my guest today is uh, Geshe La. He is a university professor over at the U of A. And today's theme is going to be about gratitude, so we're going to get into that. But um, before I do, I'd like to introduce uh, Geshe La and just read uh, something that, that talks about who he is and what he's doing and why we're here today because I look forward to working with him in our Healthy Aging University as a, one of our teachers. So it says here that uh, Geshe La Thupin Dorji mm -hmm. okay, uh, is one of a handful of English-speaking Tibetan Buddhist scholars. He's also a monk and teaches in uh, the post-secondary education all throughout the United States. He's been at the University of Arkansas for 10 years now. And um, he was born uh, Sanjam Padden. Sunam, Sunam Beltin. San, Padden, okay, Sunam there we Beltin, go. Yeah. And Geshe La and his family fled uh, India not long after the communist Chinese invaded Tibet, and that was in 1959. He has endured poverty and homelessness as a young child and um, over the course of his lifetime became a uh, Tibetan uh, monk, a Buddhist monk, of course. And he has uh, studied up to the PhD level and I'll let him explain what that is because it's, it's different. But um, Geshe La means special uh, spiritual teacher and I like to say that he is now my spiritual teacher as well, because even though I'm older, we all have something to learn. So since arriving um, at the University of Arkansas, he's been making a noticeable, Im noticeable impact upon students locally and globally. And so again, um, today we are going to be talking about the theme of gratitude, and I'm proud to say that I want to introduce him, and I want to start off with our first question that we do with all of our guests. Geshe La, what does healthy aging, when you hear that term, what does it mean to you, and how did you prepare for that as a Buddhist monk? I mean, healthy aging is something you cannot study right away. You need something rooted to it. It's a physical, a psychological level, a spiritual level. Mm -hmm. And at physical level, of course, you have to have a nutritious food that you need to consume day in and day out, and uh, physical exercise, and uh, you know, and then proper diet, you know, and uh, then a spiritual life, you know, living with the life is, which is, which is I call inner wealth, What's inner wealth, inner wealth, inner which is the means living with the you know. Mm, comfort, loving, kindness, tolerance, and surrounding your environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Um, the main thing that is of interest to me with regard to your childhood is that your family had to flee Tibet when the Chinese took over, mm -hmm. uh, and you ended up homeless. And so I'm curious, what you had to do to survive as a child and you told me one point that you had to grow vegetables in a drainage ditch to, go, can, to, to survive. Can you tell us about that? I mean, what obviously, obviously everybody knows this world, you know, Tibetan, around 80 to 90,000 Tibetans sort of, you know, forced to exile right. in outside of the hometown in Tibet. And my family is one of those families. And we fled from Tibet, uh, border of the, not very far from Bhutan. And my father's side of family, probably the whole town family together, a couple hundred of them we fled together. Daytime we, you know, hide caves. Nighttime you we cross over the mountains. Even we got a lot of sometimes a lot of yaks and horses to with it. We lost a lot of people in, you know, on the road. People, you know, downing in the waters. People fell down in the middle of the road in nighttime. And um, I was just, just barely remember, not much. 
and tied me at the back of the yak, because the yak is warm and keep me warm in high elevations. And so we, at the end of we reach in a Bhutan border, and in an underwater the border we, I never seen my lifetime, in a trees. We cross over the mountains, you know, streams, water. A couple of times I fell down in water. My grandpapa was jumped in the water. I never forgot, even now, whole water pour over my ears. I can see that, even I can feel now. Wow. So it's my grandpapa was jumped in the water, and, you know, pulled me out of water. And he lost some of his, you know, precious jewelries and water we cannot recover for that. At that time, my mama was pregnant, and around maybe six, seven months pregnant, my my younger brother. Wow. He's two years younger than any, me by that time. And it's it's tough. And then at the end of the reach, you know, believe in Bhutan border, and we, they, they cannot let us to go to inside the Bhutan. It's still, you know, we have to wait in the border of the Bhutan in, in Tibet. We trade, a mama trade every her jewelry, you know, horses, yaks, whatever we bought with it, she trade for the food. So my, my father, we're taking care of his, his, uh, his father, mother, my grandpapa, mama, father's side. Meantime, both are dead in a border, border, Bhutan border. And probably we've been there around a couple of years. And finally, they let us to go in Bhutan. And literally, just we go down there, we have nothing to carry. At that time, I remember somehow my father is, you know, lamb his feet broke. He cannot carry anything. My mother was going back and forth me and my brother and my father, things what we have eaten, everything she kept going back and forth and back and forth, carrying back and forth. And you know, from this small town called, you know, uh, Laya in Bhutan, to, we went to, down to, you know, Bhutan towns called Punaka. Punaka's the grow a lot of rices, which is, means in hot temperatures. Right. And we living in a grow, and we are grow over the, I mean, I was born around 14 to 15,000 C. And then for that, suddenly we end up down to Bhutan, and a border, border to the down to Bhutan, place the grow rice in a hot, humid diet, a lot of issues. Not just for that, we have to beg food and day in and day out to survive. My mother was hold both my hand, my hands here, my brother's hand, and both all of you are begging food and ask Bhutani can you give us food. So they let us sometimes they won't let us give us food instead of they ask the mother can dance. So mother sings and dances and they give it food. Sometimes they hire mother, mothers cleaning this and that things. We give it food for all your families. We eat everything with the leftover, the throw is everything. Sometimes we go to cemetery, Bhutan cemetery. Bhutan is um, Buddhism. At the cemetery, they do a lot of uh, offering for what call and um, food for and dead people. We are at the end of the ceremony, they throw away all the food, probably almost 100 dishes. Oh, wow. So we go out there, sit in asking, but give it us and some these nice people, they will give it to you. Sometimes they take it away, good food for themselves. Right. So that's that, that's things we, a little bit of Bhutan and Punaka around probably less four or five years for that. From there, we moved to near the Bhutan, you know, capital called Timbu, on the road, you know, I mean, we were just, at that time, not got a road in it, but Indian government, you know, Bhutan government, and they're making road constructions. A lot of Indians are coming road constructions. I buy, I go, you know, road construction places, I cheap small drugs, you know, side by side, 
And in nighttime, they throw away leftover rice, leftover dal, lentil soups. And I ask, can they even give it to me? I brought it to my home, we eat those things. Begin to my mama has a small couple of chickens. We have eggs, we make an omelet too. My mama makes a, a Tibetan homemade beers. You know, and in beer. local Indian people, local those, you know, road constructions, you know, drinking local Tibetan homemade beer with the she made omelet. And um, then their time, she go work with the botanists, I mean, botanic fields and road construction. I go side by ditches, like you says, you know, and uh, digging those tomatoes, the grow side by a ditch. And I pick those things, you know, put it next to our tent in a camp, a camp, a side-by-side -side camp. We put in those side-by-side, uh, you know, our camp. You know, that's how I learned how to grow tomatoes, hot peppers, yeah. you know, corns, potatoes. And sometimes my mama goes to the work for the botanists, they hire for digging and harvest for the potatoes. After they harvest potato, sometimes Tibetan people, they leave it behind, and some of them, they just, you know, kids go out there after they harvest, with bag full of potato, bring home, eat day in and day out. After you eating potato, probably one month, you get tired of the potatoes. <laughs> yeah. You can smell potato, you get nauseous. <laughs> get away. Yeah. I mean, that kind of thing is a tough life. The tough life makes, like I said before, you know, healthy aging. We have to go through a lot of tough things. We've been through a lot of tough and before that, but these things are experienced throughout from Tibet to in, in a Bhutan, middle of nowhere, sleeping side by side road, inside of the in a house, you know, and uh, literally nowhere. And eating everything what you can, you know, hands on it. And that thing that makes appreciative it is all my life, in my life right now, what I have, what I got surrounding food, you know. And a company is a wonderful nation like this I'm living in. I'm much more appreciative. And you know, our, our theme today is gratitude. So what I'm curious about is, I know as, as a Buddhist monk that, that you're grateful for everything. But how did that shape your opinion and the way that you looked at the world, having that experience as a young child? How did that change you? It's yes, it's there are a lot of negatives and positives generally comes with it. And there are no negative, there are no positive to it. There are no good, there are no bad to it. But besides that, psychologically you learn to taking essence of the life. Doesn't matter what you've been through, difficult time, there are somehow you can transform that into gratitude or maybe pleasure in something you can live on positive way. Right, very good. Well, and that leads into the next question that, that you went into the monastery at age 13. And what, what motivated you to become a monk at that point, having had that experience? And after we did the road construction time, then they began to tell us, uh, we're going to give it to you Botanical government, some other organization involved, and we're going to provide you Tibetan, Tibetan settlement. So we begin to go to Tibetan settlement. It has got Kasaka. There are around four or five Tibetan small settlement. Where I go, Kasaka is 500, around 500 Tibetans. So as we reach the Kasaka, I mean, good thing, but my mother's side of the lot of families. Also, they escape from Tibet to India. They are all, in Tibet, they are Sema nomads. My father's side is 100% nomads. Oh, wow. They don't know how to agriculture zero. 100%. Yeah. Wow. My mother's side is a Sema nomad. So, a lot of Tibetans are Sema nomad. So, they know how to grow, you know, balics, weeds, potatoes, darkens, you know, turnips. And even though they don't know a lot of, about, you know, you know uh, fruit trees, and, uh, but they put about land as middle of the, in a clip of the mountain. So we managed to bring water into the, in the Tibetan settlement places, miles and miles from the mountains. 
begin to making some more ditches. We fill in water inside of that this, you know, all ruling botanic house, tear it down, you know, we harvest everything what they have. We begin building houses, and then begin to settle in. We have a decent house to live in. I'm very thankful for that. So we begin to have a, something you can harvest, grow permanent place you can grow. And I think each people provide maybe have acres. I don't have acres to it. And, but at that time, you know, begin to Tibetans now begin to see as a purpose of the we are in the exile is not just probably run away, not just for we come here refugees, we come here forced to exile. That means danger in where we were used to in the Tibet, culture, heritage, and languages, you know, and these things are begin to vanish or destroying in it. So Dalai Lama, his holiness Dalai Lama and you know, organizations, they begin to be created in you know, education for Tibetan children. And they begin to teach writing, reading, grammars. These things they begin to teach. And even I remember before we come to settlement, I went to study probably nine or ten, began to study writing, reading, although, although we don't have a paper. We have to make a similar boat, and that put there, you know, black powder, and then we have to make an ink out from, you know, all nutshells. And we have to go to the mountains, pick up bamboo. We make a pen, a pen ourselves, you know. Bamboo cut it in the middle of it, in making hole in it. There's ink drainage to it. They have to making wow. the pens, you know. Wash after you write it down. They wash. You can wash it down. You can draw it out. Uh, then you can put ash. You can make ash lines. That's how you learn everything. Script writing, readings. Oh, wow. That way. Then they all began to Tibetans, you know, have a spiritual, you know, some monks are escaped from Tibet to India in Bhutan at that time. I was in Bhutan. They began to building a small temple at the Tibetan settlement okay. in, in, in Kasaka. So they are around at that time, two, three monks there. We, a couple of young like my age, a couple of boys like my ages, we joined. We have around 25 monks. I was, you know, asked my mama to, you know, I want to join the monastery. She said, fine. My brother, my brother was upset. He, he really was a gum monk. But my mama said, no, you have to stay at home to taking care, you know, the mama and the families. So that's how my interest was. And I mean, early ages, I was drawn to become monk because of the, you know, I was inspired by other monks that come around. Their knowledge and their intelligent, their dedicated service to other living beings, those those things me inspired me to be become monk. That's how that's how I was become monk at the Bhutan Simol, you know, temple, and, and then around seventy three, I decided to go to South India for study and philosophy which is Simon Monastery, they could not provide it, those kind of system. Only we do memorizations, chantings, prayers, and those things we do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that leads into asking about the, the Buddhist education. And it, it took you 25 years to get your Ph.D. in philosophy and psychology? Yeah, yeah. Explain to our American audience because they can't even imagine taking 25 years. How is it that it, that yeah, it took, so, takes that long? How does that work? Some of the university students ask me, but uh, what do you study in the 25 <laughs> years of monasteries? And I say, you know, for me, even the 25 years is not enough. And what basically curriculum, unlike we are here at the university, where I'm teaching right now, almost 10, 11 years now. A Tibetan curriculum or subject matters or study is unique, authentic, written by second, third, fourth century Indian master in Nalanda University. Mm -hmm. Nalanda University. 
and these things are uh, even Lord Buddha thought over a hundred volumes they are uh, too much volume people cannot comprehend Indian master that condensed level small condensed level five major subjects you know like a you know Buddhist metaphysics Buddhist Vinaya which is mean you know ethics and a professional wisdom sutra and there are other things there are five major subjects they've been introduced Tibetans are memorized those Indian and a root this called root textbook written by Indian masters translate Tibetan language these things are memorized subject by subject thesis by thesis ascendant by ascendance day in and day out 24 7 think discuss examine have to go through like that wow you know every day listen in a seven to nine ten to out seven to ten hours debate courtyard it's not good not good enough to you memorize it not good enough to you master teach you what meaning of the what mean by that you know the textbook but you have to intellectually, you have to learn ourself. Only way that you can do is go to Korea, experience yourself. Right, right. One by one, sometimes group by group. Sometimes you can stand by in front of everybody. Everybody can challenge you. For instance, I said my life is prominent. You say it's impermanent. You challenge me. Prove me it's not permanent, impermanent. You need to follow fact, reasons, logics. You know, they follow with the, you know, curriculum that design with the syllogism, you know, subject, thesis, reasons. That day one you join a monastery, they teach you what subject, thesis, reasons, relationships. Mm -hmm. How you can, you cannot comprehend thesis without proper reason with proper subject right exactly and now you said a minute ago though that 25 years wasn't enough yeah in in terms of gratitude what i'm hearing from you is that you're grateful for the the um, experience that you had but you you realize that there's still more yes yes what, yeah. what more is there? You've been doing this for so it's, long. In the Tibetan, it's called, you know, te sam gomsum. Uh, three ways you can learn. Number one is the power of the hearing. Power of the hearing. You hear, you listen, you got lessons from your master, teachers, in transformations, initiations, empowerment, you name it. You learn everything out of it. Intellectually, second is called the power of the intellectual. Exercise, your courtyard, your, your debate, your challenge. The third is called the power of the meditation. These one lead to other power of the hearing, power of intellectual, power of meditation. One lead to other. Without you cannot meditate without intellectual exercise. Without you know, have a proper guided master to it. So it's 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 we have an English, you know, negative thoughts, negative deeds, and ignorance. We have an addictions. Everybody we have struggled with these things. They are endless to it. They are as long as they are endless to it. They are endless. Need to be studied constantly, pursue that, overcome that, demon that exists within ourselves. You know, and that leads to to something that um, I forget which. Uh, philosopher was but he said that life is not worth living unless you examine it yeah and yes. so that's does that pretty much sum up why you're grateful for all that you've gone through yeah. because you've you've examined your life you've you've looked at um, all type of different disciplines and as a teacher mm -hmm. what I want to ask you is what is it that you feel like in terms of gratitude that that uh, uh, Americans may be missing what should we be grateful it's, it's, for? It's a, we, we focus on too much fears and shame and guilt. There you go. And negatives. And Tibetans are, yes, we are not perfect. 
we are not enlightened person. Each single us has a habit, addictions, negatives. But doesn't mean you have to be live in that kind of negative deeds. Right. And the Tibetan is look it into instead of that, doesn't matter how bad you are, doesn't matter how old you are, your life is precious. Doesn't matter what you thinking you have guilt, you know, sin, but still your life is precious, that way you can turn around. Mm-hmm. That's the focus of much more positive way to our, overcome rather than living with the fear and the shame and the guilt. That downing ourselves, you're thinking constantly, thinking those concepts like you are sink, you're, you're, you fall into a sinking hole. You can, more you more you shake around, more you more you downing, sinking, more sinking in it. That that's the Tibetan called lojong, mind training. Mind training. You need to train your mind. Without that uh, gratitude, without that you have an understanding of the being contentment, and uh, uh, satisfaction, and uh, and joyfulness, and. Uh, Without understanding the leisureness of your life, and then you're living with the shame and the guilt, that will downing everything what you have. You know, and that, that leads to a closing thought that I want from you, that my undergraduate degree is in psychology, and it, it always upset me that, as you said, that they focused on the negative. Mm-hmm. That psychology is based on looking at the abnormal and saying, this is normal. And as a kid, I said, that's just not right. That's not right. So, you know, there may be someone watching this down the road here that that is thinking about suicide, that thinking that they are a failure, that there is nothing for them. No. What what can you share with them to help? Yeah. Natural, very natural, you have to look it into. Positive and negative can react each other. So you that means that you focus on too much in negative. You forget about the positive out of it, right? And that's how you can counteract. You're looking into positive. You, those people think, you know, my life is worthless, my life is meaningless. They don't, don't thinking there are a lot of good things I can make out of it. You have to focus on whatever you're good at. Everybody has a quality and good quality. Everybody has a bad quality, bad qualities. Focus on good qualities. So suppose you are good art, you need to focus on art that may can give you a comfort level. Often I teach you know corruption girls, in the way you overcome your shame and guilt, why to overcome is you need to focus, you know, to cultivate positive deeds, such like service other living beings. Very good. That that's I, I like that. Because that's to, to sum it up, what I hear you saying, because the, the, the bottom line is that we're so focused on material things, physical, and and the negative part of that, because there's negative and positive. So your your takeaway message for people is, yes, you have to look at both, but focus on the positive? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. So we're at the end here. And I will thank you very much, Geshe-la. I'm so glad you're my spiritual teacher. Oh, thank you, thank you. And um, by way of summing this up in the last couple of seconds, what I'd like to say to uh, everyone watching this is that we will be doing a um, gratitude garden meditation practice together. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching Celebrate Aging.